Well, welcome class to week number four of our Foundations class on the Holy Spirit. And this is one of my favorite weeks as we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the importance of it, what it is. And so many people in the body of Christ do not understand what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. And so we're going to take an in-depth look, scriptural, biblical look of what it means to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The, the beautiful part about this is your choice. Obviously, at salvation, we get Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit moves into us, but we're talking about something that's separate, something that's uh, in addition to that. And we're going to talk about that, what that looks like. So let's take a moment and let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit uh, just to come and, and flood this place with revelation. Holy Spirit, we welcome you tonight. We ask again for your presence. We ask that you would just bring just understanding into this room. You are the teacher, and we submit ourselves again to you. We come with open eyes, open hearts, open spirits to receive from your heart tonight. Lord, plant the seeds, water the seeds, do whatever you want to do tonight. Lord, we just ask for your presence to come dwell among us and just teach us tonight. Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for who you are and what you're doing in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's dig in. We got a lot of material tonight, and again, it's it's more than just uh, material. It's more than just information. Remember, we're asking for revelation. We just don't want head knowledge. We want stuff that will impact our heart, bring uh, encouragement, strengthen our hearts, but also build us up for the the journey ahead. So, what is the the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is an experience between a believer and the Holy Spirit that happens after and separately from salvation, okay? And again, at any time, if you have questions, if you're not sure what's happening, if you're not sure about some things, please, now's the time to, to ask questions. It's okay, all right? And I know some people are like, really? What, you know, if you're, if, depending on how you grew up, depending what church you went to, you, this may be somewhat new to you, or maybe something that's just refreshing and renewing to you, okay? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not necessary for salvation. You can be saved and never even heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the baptism is, is an empowering of the believer for ministry. When the Holy Spirit moves inside of us, it's, it's primarily for an individual. The initial infilling that's received at salvation is a work of God on the individual. Does that make sense? So the moment you receive salvation, Holy Spirit moves in, and he begins the process of changing us. Remember we talked a couple weeks ago about God being the architect, right? Jesus being right, the contractor, and the Holy Spirit being the subcontractor. And so as we look at that, all right, when the Holy Spirit moves in, he begins rearranging, redoing, tearing things down, building things up in us to create in us in the image of Jesus, right? That's an individual thing. So what we're looking at from the perspective of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is how do we supercharge our ministry gifts? How do we supercharge the, those things that we're called to do, all of us? that God has written down in his book for you and me. How do we get that and take it to a whole nother level? And we're going to look at the impact it had biblically and then also the impact that it can have for you. So how can you say it's separate from salvation? Let's take a look at a few scriptures and see if we can build this and see where we go. John 20, verse 17. Jesus is talking, okay? And he said, don't cling to me, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. In other words, he went through, he was on the cross, Okay, he, the resurrection happened, but he hadn't yet ascended. And remember, Jesus said, I've got to go in order for what? Holy Spirit to come, right? So this is before the Holy Spirit has come. So he said, don't cling to me. In other words, uh, somebody was reaching out. It was Mary. He would reach out. And he, obviously, she wanted to grasp him. He said, don't cling to me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God, and your God. So Mary Magdalene found the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them this message. So Jesus is telling Mary, don't touch me because I haven't returned to the Father. All right? Now why is this taking place? When is this? It's resurrection day. This is taking the place, the day of Jesus' resurrection. He came out of the tomb and he had not yet, you know, went back to the Father. And so he said, don't touch me. And, and, and this is one of these descriptions, like, really, why, what, you know, we'll find out how it connects a little bit later. Look at the very next verse. That evening, on the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were very afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them, and he said, peace be with you. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see. He showed them his side. 
They were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. He spoke to them again. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he did something. Now pay attention to this because this is the introduction of the first part. Remember, when in history, in the biblical history, when does Holy Spirit come? The day of what? Pentecost, right? So now let's get what Jesus did here on this night, uh, the very night of the, his resurrection. Look what it says. Then he breathed on and said to them, what? Receive the Holy Spirit. You get that? So before Holy Spirit had come, before he went to the Father and sent the promise, one of his closest, dearest ones, okay, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I guess the question would be, did they receive the Holy Spirit at that time? <clears throat> yeah. Because Jesus gave it to them. It was his to give, right? So he gave them the Holy Spirit. What did he say to them? He spoke peace to them because they knew they were scared. He commissioned them, right? Jesus comforted them. He commissioned them. And he told them to receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? The next verse. One of the disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. When he came in, they told him, hey, we've seen the Lord. But he said, I won't believe it until I see the nails. The nail wounds in the hands, put my fingers in them, place my hand into the wound in his side. So Thomas wasn't there. He missed the faith building. But what else did he miss? Holy Spirit, right? Because he wasn't in the room when Jesus breathed on him. So Thomas missed seeing Jesus on resurrection day. He missed the Holy Spirit's infilling at that time. Okay, so he was dealing with a whole separate issue when he came back together with his brothers who had the initial infilling of the Holy Spirit. Let's take it to the next few verses. Eight days later, okay? Get it in your head, okay? Resurrection happened. Um, next day, Thomas, you know, and then eight days later, they were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. The doors were all locked. Suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. He then said, peace be to you, with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, put your hand in my wound. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And then Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. He got it. Okay. So eight days later, where were they? Behind locked doors, same thing. Why? Still afraid. Eight days later, right? So what did Jesus do to help Thomas? What did, did you notice what he invited him to do? Touch him. Okay. So Jesus, what, so in other words, let's say it, let, let's go with it a little bit. If he invited it, initially on the day of resurrection, Jesus said, don't touch me, right? Why? Because he hadn't what? He hadn't gone back to the Father. So what are we what are we believing, or what can we read then from this that what did Jesus must have done? Somewhere in those days, he he must have gone to the Father. Right? Something took place in those eight days because now he's inviting them to touch them. It doesn't, you know, the scripture it, it doesn't tell us. But we can just assume from what he talked about before, eight days sooner, don't touch me. Now all of a sudden he's saying, touch me. Okay, Jesus, now here's, here's the thing, and, and you can see it a little bit later on when you get to the story whenever that, you know, Jesus was on the beach and the guys were fishing. Jesus must have looked physically different. Because they didn't recognize Jesus, did they? We'll get to that story. So there was something about when Jesus went back to the Father, something, something happened. And he must have looked different physically. Okay? He must have looked very different than what he had before the resurrection. No one dared ask him if he was really Jesus, yet they were sure of it. They were learning to live by faith and not by sight. So here's the story, John 21, 12. Remember they were fishing all night. Let me do the backstory. The guys went fishing, right? They didn't catch anything. Uh, some guy shows up on the bank, tells them to throw, hey, throw your net on the other side, right? Now, how would you react if some guy, you were fishing all night, you were tired, you were grumpy, and some guy you didn't recognize 
Hey, try the other side. Yeah. But John immediately recognized Jesus. Why? Look, John 21, 12. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And no one dared ask him if he really was the Lord because they were sure of it. If they knew by recognizing him, how could they not recognize him? They were with him for three years, right? So there must have been something different about him physically when he went back to the Father. Making sense? Some of you all doing? Hmm. Hmm. So be on the same page. Okay? He couldn't have looked like he did before his resurrection. They began to believe without seeing everything in the natural. The measure of the Holy Spirit they had at this point enabled them to recognize Jesus, deal with their own problems, fear, guilt, doubt, guilt, and shame. That's all personal thing, individual self-ministry things. They were dealing with their issues of, you know, Jesus died, okay, now he's here again. They were dealing with fear. They were dealing with what are the Jewish people going to do to us? Uh, are we going to die like he did? Uh, we're going to be outcasts, all of these things. Jesus pops in, Jesus pops out. Kind of scary, everything's locked. Boom, there he is. And it's like, whoo, everything's just going, okay. So let's go to Acts, chapter 1. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, okay, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. So during the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus gave orders to the apostles. How did he give the orders to them? He didn't always just show up. How did he speak to them? What's that verse say? Verse 2. How did he speak to them? Use the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Because when did they receive the Holy Spirit? When he breathed on them. Right? You see the importance of the Holy Spirit? But he was dealing with his personal issues. So he had breathed on them. That's how over the period of those 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, he was communicating them. He always just didn't pop in. Occasionally he did. But he was speaking to them, even then, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard of from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what happened? Jesus told them not to leave, but wait for the promise, right? The promise of the Father was what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, stay here, you will be baptized. So Acts 1, verse 6 or 8. So when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom? So they still had the natural mindset. They still had that, that man, you've got to rescue us. You've got to rescue the nation. You've got to rescue us people. Things are bad here. The Romans are bad. Remember, they killed you and there's persecution and everything. Is it is now as you're going to come into your kingdom and make everything right? And Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or epics which the Father had fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Okay? Don't miss that. Okay? Now look what it says. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When at salvation, what is the Holy, where does the Holy Spirit go? In you, right? Do you see the difference? Do you see what Jesus was saying? At salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in you to begin a personal work of transformation. What he's referring to here is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to give you power to do what you're called to do. So your ministry, every one of you has a ministry. The way you do your ministry is supercharged through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're missing out on that particular power that's available to you. Okay, so what did he tell them in verse 8? Jesus told them when they received the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when he came upon them, they would three specific things. Receive power, be his witnesses, and take the gospel to the remotest parts of the world. Okay, Acts 1.9. After he said these things, 
He was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of his sight. Forty days after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus was standing on the mountain with them. He said, I got to go, guys. And he told them, you know, go, go into all the world, make disciples, that kind of thing. Away he went. Okay, let's pick it up. Same chapter, same chapter a little bit later on, a couple verses later. Then, after what? After they saw him go, they started walking back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, about a half a mile away. Okay? When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Okay? That is Peter, James, he lists all the people who were there. Okay? They were these were all one mind, were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Jesus' brothers had come around to understand who he was and accepted him. They were all together in the upper room. Okay? Did they have the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Because Jesus breathed on them. Okay? So what they were doing with that? They were together. They were praying. Okay? Then what happens in Acts chapter 2? Well, the day of Pentecost comes, which is seven weeks after the resurrection. Okay? They were all together in one place. Suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house while they were sitting. They were still together praying several weeks later. They were waiting for God, right? Because Jesus said, stay and wait. Wait for the promise. you got to hang in there wait. Now, think about it. It was a number of weeks, you know, 40 days, and then there was still some time in there before the Holy Spirit came. Uh, put yourself in the position. Jesus says, go into Jerusalem and wait. Did he tell them a specific time? No, he did not. Now think how we would react. How would you react? How well do you do waiting? If you have little kids, how well would you say, hey, you got to wait. you got to wait for supper. Oh, I'm starving. I'm going to die. Or, you know, you got to wait for your birthday. Oh, I can't wait. To, you know, whatever it is. You know, we think that's the end. Well, here they just saw the one they hung their entire life on leave and said, go and wait. The promise is coming. Okay? So, suddenly, not according to their plans, a wind, and it defines kind of in, in the Greek there, when the Holy Spirit is used in the New Testament, the word spirit is translated, and there it tells you the the Greek. So God breathed his spirit hard into the place. The Holy Spirit came in a powerful way. Back in Genesis, we see the same concept of the spirit being delivered by the breath of God when God put his spirit in Adam. Genesis 2, then the Lord God formed man of dust in the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He became spiritually alive. That was powerful. That was forceful. That God brought life, spiritual unity, and with him in his mouth. So John 20, 22, it says, and when he said this, he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. We're going back to that night when he stood in front of them on the day of resurrection and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now back to Acts. Okay? You get in the picture, in the, in the room, together, all of a sudden, something supernatural happens, it begins to, to shake. I mean, you, you know, it's not just like, Oh, I wonder if something happened. I mean, there was no doubt. I mean, and, and I imagine if we were there, if it would happen right here, I mean, some of us would probably be like, uh, you know, on our knees. We'd be like, like some people hollering, might be some people weeping, thinking the buildings, you know, what's happening? I'm sure they were experiencing it. They probably just weren't sitting like, oh, this is good. Glad I waited for this. They were probably like, whoa. There appeared to them, and they could see all of this. Okay, this is not something that's abstract. This is not just something that they made up. This is not just something that was in their minds. It wasn't a dream. It was reality that they could see tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. So if they were sitting around, however many were in the room, they could see these tongues like a fire coming down on top of each other's heads. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, didn't they have the Holy Spirit? Yeah. But here it says again, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You see why it's a, a separate event from the initial filling of the Holy Spirit at salvation. And we're going to see in a few minutes what the, what the incredible need for the baptism is. Okay? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Those of you who have experienced 
the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. You know what that's like. You know. And, and listen, it's not always. I've been in places, I've been in times, you know, when we prayed for people or been in rooms where people were praying for the baptism. And for those that have, that have that experience, you know it can be a wide variety of emotions. Okay? I've seen some people just fall over. I've seen some people shake. I've seen some people, you know, kind of just laugh. I've seen, but you know what I've, I've seen when praying for I've seen some people just by faith receive it and there seemingly is no outward showing of something. But by faith, they receive. Does that make sense? So it's not necessarily there always has to be some sort of manifestation. There certainly can be. Often there is. Okay? So look, let's, let's go. something strange and new just happened. And they started talking in tongues. So what happened around them? As they, were, as they were speaking these different languages, godly Jews from many nations were living in Jerusalem at the time, and they heard the sound. So there was something apart from the upper room. There was something in the atmosphere around them. There was something, cataclysmic noise, that attracted people from all over the city. Okay? And they came running to see what it was about. It, who knows what it sounded like? I, what, it was a violent wind, okay, that was in one location. Once It was probably like, you know, in the middle of a town or a story, if something blows up, every, you know where it is, but you don't know what happened, and people rush toward it, right? Same thing happened. Something happened in the middle of the town at this one particular place, and people were so, it was so unusual and so odd and rare that people ran, okay, to see what happened. And as they were running there, they were bewildered because they heard these guys and ladies speaking in their own languages. They were beside themselves with wonder, how can this be? These people are all from Galilee, from one very specific place. Yet we hear all of these languages where we were born, and they list all the places, Mesopotamia, some Asia, some Egypt, Libya, all of these, some Rome, okay, Arabians, all, and all we hear these people speak in our own language about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed, and perplexed, and what can this mean? So what happened when God showed up? He draws a crowd. Always does. Okay. Why did he show up? Because the disciples were obedient. They waited. If they wanted to wait, who knows what would happen? Okay. They were from every language, every nation. So what was the result? They were bewildered, curious, interested, amazed, and drawn. But there's always in a crowd, and this is important to understand, when God shows up, some specific things happen. Acts 2, what others in the crowd were saying what? They're, they're drunk. That's all they said. So when God starts moving in a, in, in a church or in a, in a meeting, or in a small group, wherever it is, there are three very specific things that usually happen. One is people will come to see what's going on. When God moves someplace, it always attracts people. Whether it's a large revival, a big church, it can be a small church. Whenever God's moving and doing something, it will always attract people. It always has. It always will. The second part of that is not only will it attract people, there will be a certain percentage of people who always make fun of it. Because they don't understand. And the third part of that is there's others in the group who are nervous about it, don't understand it, and they'll fight against it. Those three things always happen. When God begins to move, when he does something so extraordinary, even though we're not sure what it is, we know there's move, we know people are coming, people are getting saved, people are getting delivered, people are getting baptized, all of these things, what happens is it will always track people. It will always track people who think you're nuts. Okay? And then you always attract mostly religious people who say that's not God. He doesn't work well. Does that make sense? It's the same thing individually. When God begins to use a person, I mean really use them in a, in a way that you, you take your gift things and, and it's supercharged with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you start going out and doing something. You're witnessing or praying for people and you're seeing people healed or people saved and all of those things. Guess what happens? It's the same thing. There'll be people, certain people drawn to you because they see the power in you and they want what you have, right? They're curious. But then there's also those people who'll be like, <laughs> that just, you know how nuts she is and they'll write in social media, help, you know, stay away from her. She's a religious fanatic. She's off the top. 
she's just holier than thou, and they'll start. Then there's those people who will actively fight against you. Always happens. So be aware of that. Okay, now let's see the baptism at work. What is it? Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared, Men of Judea, all of you lived in Jerusalem, let it be known, give heed to my words. Okay? Now remember, they were hiding, they were afraid, they were in the upper room, blah, blah, blah. Now all of a sudden, Peter stands up. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m. Okay? But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. So he goes on to give that prophecy from Joel chapter 1. Okay? All of that. So Peter, in a new power, okay, was quoting the Old Testament and say, no, this is what the prophet stated would happen. It's happening today. It's happening here. It's happening right now. Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Does that sound like a guy who was afraid and terrified and wanted to stay in his room? What's the difference? There's no other difference than I can see scripturally other than what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had come upon them. Now all of a sudden there was a power that wasn't there before. There was a boldness that wasn't there before. There was courage that wasn't there before. There was a tapping into the, the Spirit. Even though they had the Holy Spirit, now it was almost like it was supercharged. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit does. What's the difference? Boldness, witnessing, power. Here comes the power, Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, Peter's words, Peter's message, they were what? Pierced to the heart and said to Peter, and they were hollering to the rest of them, what do we do? I mean, the, the message was so powerful. The message was displayed in power. The message was displayed with authority. I mean, he hadn't even done any miracles yet, right? He hadn't done any other. I mean, yes, they were t speaking in tongues. That was miraculous. But it wasn't like they healed anybody, right? It wasn't like there was any signs of wonders at that moment, at that time. What cut them to the heart? It was Peter speaking. Have you ever been in a, in a meeting or in a, hearing somebody on the radio or a podcast or something where you just knew that person, male or female, had an anointing and had seemingly an authority that so many other people did? When you just listened to them, you could hear something. You were like, man, this person, I mean, this person has an authority that's real. That's what happened to you. There was an authority that all of a sudden people were like, what do we do? Tell us, what do we do? So this is what he said. Repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the people that heard it were cut to the heart. Okay? Acts 2, verse 40 then. And with many other words, he testified, kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added about 3,000 souls. I, can I just take a minute? And I know this is going off the deep end here or off the side here and something that just, Can you imagine... I mean, there was just how many of them in the upper room? Not a lot. So now all of a sudden, after, doesn't say how long this was, time-wise, okay? So it happened at 9 a.m., okay? But, you know, Peter speaks a little bit. What do we do? Repent, be baptized. All of a sudden, now think, how many people? Approximately 3,000. Um, I, I want what you have. I mean, imagine the guys and gals in that room who were listening and watching, everything's going on, and they're like, yeah, God, you go, God. Now all of a sudden, like, uh, yeah, we want it. And we're like, what do you think they did? What do you think was going through their minds? There was, I'm sure there was much joy and elation. There was probably a, uh, what do we do now? <laughs> Can you look at like, uh, do you know what we're going to do? Uh, do you know what we're going to do? There seems to be a lot of people here. And then they, they wanted to baptize him, so it's like, okay, um, who wants to be baptized? I mean, 3,000. <laughs> like, do you know how long that would take to baptize? It wasn't like there was a lot of them to start out with, right? I mean, just think, we just read this and go like, oh, that was great. You know, the logistics, you know, if we had a meeting some Sunday morning and, and 3,000 people sort of go like, I want Jesus. And we're like, okay, what do we do now? How do we connect with 3,000 people? How do they find out their names? It'd be nice to know their names, right? Baptize them. That would take a while. 
You see what I mean? We just read these stories sometimes, and we totally miss the backstory. We totally miss all the things that must have been going through the heads. Okay, that's Holy Ghost power, 3,000 saved the first day. So let's look at the contrast of the disciples before and after the baptism. What were they doing when Jesus first showed up? Hiding. Now the boldness level is what? And the witnessing level. It's supercharged. Okay? Boldness, witnessing, it's a power ministry. I want to go down. Do you have Mark 16? Do you have that scripture? Got it? Okay. Mark 16. Mark gives another description. You know, he says this, these signs will accompany those who have believed. To those who have believed in his name, to those who have given their hearts to him. What? In my name, in Jesus' name, they will cast out demons. They'll have power and authority to cast out a demon. Where does the power and authority come from? Holy Spirit. Right? Now, let me give you this. Think about this for a moment. You can, you have power and authority by the initial infilling of the Holy Spirit. You have that authority. Now think about it. How much authority might you gain by the baptism of the Holy Spirit? If you have authority to cast out demons just by the in the first infilling, that extra supercharged? You see why it's crucial to understand the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Want it, desire it, ask for it, and then move in it. Why? Because Mark said they will speak with new tongues. Okay? Those of you who speak in tongues. It's usually because of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It's because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? They will pick up serpents. If they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. That sounds like a pretty power ministry. That sounds like power there. Where does the power come from? Holy Spirit. Okay. So then when the Lord Jesus had spoke to them, he was received up in heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out after that, and they preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them. Okay, this is key. I love how I love how Mark puts it. His take on this. Uh, and if you read each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, go back to when Jesus left the earth, getting ready to leave. Each of the, those four writers, okay, had a different take on this, and they each had their own perspective. Right? They were each individual people, and so they were seeing the same event. Event, but they wrote a little bit about it. it. Wasn't that one was off or not? It was as if they wrote from their view, their lens. Okay? And I love how Mark put it. Look what it says. They went out after that time and preached everywhere while what? While the Lord worked with them. You see? What is this implying? Isn't it implying it's a partnership? Isn't that what it's saying? Look, look what it said. T look at that again. So, and they went out and preached, okay, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word. What was the word? The things they spoke, right? The things that was on God's heart, the things that Jesus said, go teach them what, what's on my heart, teach them to obey them. So it confirmed the word by what? The signs that followed. Don't miss it, this, because this is crucial. When he confirmed and he also worked with them, he's partnering with you. Very little gets done in the kingdom unless his body gets it done. Is that making sense? He's the head. We're the body. The head wants to accomplish certain things, and he's asking the body to do it. But if the body chooses not to do it, it's not going to be done. Okay? The power of the baptism is for the kingdom, not just the enjoyment of the kids of the kingdom. John 14. Most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. And, what? Greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. The reason we can do greater works than Jesus did is because he was one person, although filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, When did Jesus get filled with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, when he got baptized. Right? He came to John. John was baptizing. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up. John goes, hey, no, no, I'm not baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus says, no, no, I need you to baptize me. If you read the account, one of the accounts of the Gospels, John argues with them. No, I'm not worthy. I don't want to do that. This is wrong. And Jesus is like, no, you got to do it. And the reason you got to do it, because Scripture says you got to do it, blah, blah, blah. So John <laughs> baptized him. At the moment he comes out of the water, it said John. So one of the, the, of the four Gospels says John, or I mean, 
Yeah, John saw the heavens open, okay? And he, it was like the dove, the Holy Spirit, was ascending and descending on Jesus. And then he audibly heard Jesus, the Father, say, this is my son. I'm pleased with it. That was an experience for John. Like, okay? That's when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus. So from that time on, Jesus' ministry was supercharged because he now had the Holy Spirit so he could do his ministry. Okay, so what kind of works did Jesus do? Well, healing, casting out demons, raising from the dead, prophesying, being an evangelist. He tells the church where his body, we will do greater works. Look at the definition of greater. Greater means mega or megas in the Greek. Okay, means high, large, loud, mighty. Are you ready to do mega works? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the equipping provision from Jesus that enables us to do mega works in his name. Okay? Don't seek the signs and wonders, just seek Jesus. When you seek Jesus and everything he has for you, seek first the kingdom and what? All these other things will be added to you. Okay? So, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's a supercharging of all the tools of ministry to enable you to succeed at the work you're called to do in the sphere that you're called to do it, in your lane, in the place that he's, you're called, in the place that you live, in the place that you work, all of those things. We don't do ministry over here apart from us, okay? We don't do ministry over here apart from our marriage. We don't do ministry apart from our children. We don't do ministry apart from our jobs. We don't, no, it's all one. We have to learn to see that. We cannot compartmentalize it's all one. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit supercharges that. It's a supernatural enabling to live a Christ-centered instead of self-centered life. It's an incredible step of faith that, will, faith that will enable you to be all that God has called you to be. If you, were still, if you were still alive, you would not be able to handle the power and influence without being corrupted. Now, there's a number of... Um, do you have the, the scriptures at the end? A page of scripture? You don't have that page? Okay. There's, there's scriptures, and I don't know, maybe it's, um, we'll, we'll get them to things, but some of them are just going over again what it means to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can get that to you. Questions? Thoughts? Do you guys have some more stuff? You're looking at me like, are we done? Did you have a, the uh, story of Charles Finney? Do you have that? Okay. That's a great story. You guys can read that. Um, it, it just is a personal testimony of his kind of what it means to, to have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Questions, thoughts, comments, stories of when you experienced it, for those that have. I guess a couple of things that me that the, the uh, I, early on, I guess in my church life, I was always taught, you know, it was a once and done deal. But as I grew and learned, when it says be filled with Holy Spirit, the Greek translation, the best I understand, is be being filled. Mm -hmm. So it's a continual process. Mm -hmm. It's not I was filled and now I, you know, it, it can be daily, you know. I think it was Ernie one time told me, he said, you know, he's, I, I, I don't quote me exactly, but I think he said he starts his day by, I forget his exact words, but Holy Spirit, what would you have for me today? You know, it's a be being filled mm -hmm. situation, and I've taken your court this class before, but and I think I shared this in the last one, but I don't know who all was there or not. But um, I had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues for a, a little while, but I was at a, a conference and I heard this lady speaking in tongues, and like I heard her. And I heard her speaking in tongues, and then just like that, and this wasn't something in my mind, I literally heard her speaking in English. But, and I don't know how to explain this to you other than, I'm going to call it weird, I know it wasn't weird, it was God, but she was speaking in tongues, but then, like, it's like, it all of a sudden, for me, to my ears, I audibly heard, it all of a sudden went to English. So... I guess I was a little bit of a doubting Thomas at the time because I said to my wife, I said, did she, after it was kind of things concluded, and I said, did she ever quit speaking in tongues? 
And Kelly said, no, she prayed in tongues the whole entire time. I said, well, then I have to share with you what happened. I said, I heard, and it was only three words. I'm not going to pretend or add, you know make it bigger than what it was, but I still remember it to this day. It, the three words I heard were, it's coming out. And those words came out of her mouth, and I heard it in plain English. And like I said, I can't stress this enough. I asked Kelly, I said, you know, did she ever quit speaking in tongues? And she said, no, she did not. So that was one of my experiences uh, with tongues, where obviously I, I guess you would consider that I was given interpretation mm -hmm. right then and there, sure. even though she didn't quit speaking in tongues, I heard three words in plain English come out of her mouth. Right. So that was, I'll just, it, it's never happened since then, it's the only time it's happened to me, but it, yeah, it, can I say it was neat, it was awesome, it was quite an experience to have mm -hmm. that happen. Mm -hmm. Good. And I think since then, in the church I was at, I think I was good, I got to add, I think some revelation came out of those three words. Too, and I'll just leave it at that. But, sure. yeah. So that was one of my experiences. Uh -huh. The reason why it's it's more than just an initial experience whenever you ask to pray for it is because if you look at the scriptures, I mean, and it, there was multiple times, especially read the book of Acts, multiple times they were together after the day of Pentecost, praying, seeking the Lord, and what happened? The Holy Spirit showed up again, multiple times. So you know it wasn't just a one thing, otherwise Pentecost would have just been once, right? And that would have been in the example, hey, just do it once, you're good. But apparently, it, for the disciples, they were together. They had, you know, that first day, 3,000, you'd be like, oh, that's pretty good. Well, a little bit later on, they were together again, praying, seeking, showed up again, boom, like, whoo. And so apparently, yes, that's something for us to pursue. It's something that causes us to go, I want more of that. It causes us to say, I'm hungry for that. Again, it's not about the signs or wonders. It's about connecting and, and, and being so tied to Holy Spirit and to, so tied to the Father and the Son that it just, it's like you're one. And that's what he wants. Does that make any sense? And it's, sometimes it's hard to, as, as spiritual things are sometimes, it's hard to define it. It's hard to talk about it. And especially hard to, to say, here's exactly what it looks like. Because it's different for different people because we all have different personalities. We all have different ways of being. I can remember uh, for myself, it was way back, um, I had just graduated college. Uh, I was 22. I started with uh, Youth for Christ at that time back in 1986. And I had, uh, they sent me to training to, to learn how to do the youth ministry in Rockford, Illinois. And I went out there for a couple weeks, you know, just by myself, went by myself. And I met a great group of guys, but I had a roommate. He was an older guy. He was like in his 50s learning youth ministry, I thought, well, it's kind of weird. And I was <laughs> a great guy. And throughout the week, we just started talking, and all of a sudden, it was the night before we were to leave, and he just asked me, he said, hey, have you ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And I grew up with a brother in church, you know, a church with a brother, and I was like, well, I really don't, I haven't heard much about that. So he took some time, and he just explained, you know, what the scriptures, used some of the scriptures that I read. It wasn't that I hadn't read them. I just had no understanding. I had no revelation. He said, would you like me to pray for you? Yeah, so just him and I sat in the chair and prayed for me, and it was just like this incredible experience. That Holy Spirit just filled the place, and I, I started. And it wasn't overly, you know, yeah, I, I cried some, but I could just, you just knew and felt the Holy Spirit was there, just coming upon me. And I just started a few words, speaking, you know, in tongues of the Lord, not understanding, and it was like, oh, what's that, you know, because I didn't understand, and and he he was just laughing because. He, he knew it was happening, and I, I'm like, whoa, you know, that kind of thing. But it was such a nice, peaceful, calming experience for me. That it was just like God moved into the room. Holy Spirit just came. And it was just wonderful peace, joy, all that we read about. It, all of a sudden, it was right there. And it was such a fantastic experience. So that was my initial experience. It just sticks with me today. Don't know his name. Never remember his name. <laughs> A lot of years ago. Probably with the Lord. Anybody else? Any other questions? Thoughts? So how do you receive it? Or how do you know? <laughs> That's a good question. 
The best way that I can do that is when the, when the time comes, whether, and it doesn't necessarily need it, it could be a small group, you know, it could be Sunday morning, get a couple of believers together, and specifically pray. Specifically ask for it. Let somebody pray over you. Somebody that has uh, already received the baptism, one of the best ways to do it, is just pray over you. Ask him for the God. The scripture says that the Father, you know, he, he's a good Father, right? And for those who ask for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give them. He's not going to give them a, what does it say? If somebody asks for an egg, he's not going to give them a stone, that kind of thing. But those who ask for the Holy Spirit, he's generous. He wants to pour that out. And so that would be a great way. You know, when it comes time, a small group would be a great time. Yeah. Hey, Ernie, what about this? And then see what God does as he shows up. And again, my experience may not be yours. Your experience may not be Jerry, because we're all different. Some people I know right away start speaking in tongues. Some people it takes a while. Some people it takes a week later. I know some real, real godly people who have asked for 20 years to speak in tongues, and I, I think they're baptized only, and never have spoken in tongues. And I know that's controversial because some people say, well, if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. And there is, to the degree that, because it says, the evidence is. Yeah. But I see some people, godly people, who have asked for years, and whatever reason, does that mean they don't? Who am I to say? I mean, they've asked, they've in faith believed, and you know, they've been prayed over multiple times. I don't know what the breakthrough <laughs> was or wasn't. That's, that's not for me to say. But good question. Other questions? Thoughts? Well, that was a question I had. You kind of answered a little bit. I know when you think about baptizing in the Holy Spirit, you automatically think of speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. So are there other forms of being baptized in the Holy Spirit than speaking in tongues? Sure. It's not, obviously it talks about that a number of places about one of the evidence of speaking in tongues. But I think it's more than that. It, it's more giving you what, what was happened to the disciples. It gave them boldness, right? It gave them courage. It gave them access to spiritual, their spiritual gifts in a greater, whole another level. That has nothing to do with speaking in tongues. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So speaking in tongues, we sometimes the body of Christ has put too much emphasis on this one, one thing. And if you read Paul's writings, I mean, he does a great job of bringing tongues back into the middle where it needs to be. That that it's not always that speaking in tongues is actually more of an individual thing. It can be corporate, of course, but it's more for you to edify because your relationship with the Father as you're speaking the language that only can understand. We put too much emphasis sometimes on it. When there's a whole other world out there of the baptism that supercharges and you know just enables us to say no to the things we couldn't say no to before, it enables us to, to to fight the enemy and you know demons, all those kind of things. It gives you authority to a whole other level, understanding revelation to a whole other level of your authority to fight demons in your own family, in your own house, and you know as you see people who are demonically oppressed, all of a sudden you have this boldness like, oh, where did that come from? You know, you begin to say things in places you never would have said things before because there's something new about it, about you. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Good. Good question. Anyone else? So the benefit of being baptized would be to get the power to do what you're called to do. To a whole other level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big ones, yeah. And I believe what it's done for me, and I see in other people's life, it, it's like a, a sharpening. It's a sharpening of your ability to hear, sharpening your ability to see. And that's why it can't be just a one-time thing. Because at one time, you know, when you initially have that in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, yeah, you're so supercharged, you're ready to go, you're ready to do, and you're there. Well, what happens months later? You need to continue to put yourself in that place of filling, in that place of asking, that place... Jesus said, ask, seek, knock, right? So if you continue to do that, he's going to pour out his spirit on you for different times, different places, different things you need, different opportunities that come before you. You step into there, all of a sudden he'll be 
in a way greater place, in way greater measure than your revision of Bach. Other thoughts? Question? Well, my experience was, um, I was probably, probably like 13 or 14, and they had um, church camp. I don't know if they ever knew over in New Columbia. Um, yeah, I think I know where it's at. I forget the name of the church. Mount Deliverance. Um, and it was a week long youth from all over the country would show up and um, we spent, in the mornings we had church from like 8 to noon and then at night we had church from like 7 to 10 and the one evening service that was the, that was the message and he just did an altar call and we all went up and it was as simple as that and I was thankful that it happened that way for me when I was young because you know, sometimes it's easier to believe things when you're mm -hmm. young Good. So I challenge you, if, if you've never been praying for that, uh, look for your opportunity. Be praying from now until that opportunity comes. Um, ask for, under, read the book of Acts. Ask, as you're doing it, ask for, say, Holy Spirit, I want to learn about this because if this is something you're offering to me, I want it. Right? And start reading the book of Acts. Let them see you and show you the power of it, where it comes from, how it happens, all of those things. And then look for your opportunity. And there'll be opportunity before you know it that opens the door and you just step right through. See what happens. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your heart for us. Thank you for your word. Lord, we stand on your word tonight, the promises of your word, the authority of your word, the finality of your word, and just the power of your word. And Lord, as you speak, um, things are shifted and changed. And Lord, I just pray for this group of people and for those who are watching, or that they may have a hunger and a thirst for you, for your presence, for the power of the Holy Spirit, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that they may seek that opportunity to, to come before you and ask, to learn, to grow in it. And Lord, to help us understand it, it gives us courage and strength to, to live our lives, holy life before you, but also supercharges our, our ministry and our ability to to minister to other people and to do that which you've called us to do and to model your way of ministering. So Lord, continue to teach us, refine us, help us to see what you're doing and how you're doing it. And Lord, I just pray for those divine appointments for each of our lives. Lord, in the next few days and weeks ahead, the divine appointments that you have for us, let the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to affect somebody's life, whether it's through a word or a prayer to lay our hands on somebody, to cast something out, or to pray for healing, and let you partner with us to see the kingdom come. And Lord, I thank you for the opportunities that are lying in front of us, and for your promises that you work with us, empowering us to do your work. Lord, thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great week.